You said to bring the pilot. Yes, I did. Well, he's here. Well, why didn't you tell me? Come on, Nord. Oh, tell me about it. The child, he had the girl with him. Yeah. And some are told, bitch! They killed Ed. <laughs> no, no. Don't you fret yourself. There's plenty more where Ed came from. <laughs> Heading west, southwest? From here. Get your feet me, off. If we launch now, we can climb down just about here. He doesn't change course. Nah, it's not like that. He's a wily one, that ick the demon. Welcome to the Mad Max Minute presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 77 and 78, which begin with Helen and Enola sporting new haircuts, and end with Deacon contemplating his new rival. We cut almost immediately to Helen and Enola sitting side by side on the deck of the Trimoran, and oh boy, yeah, the Mariner is no hairstylist. It's pretty bad. And uh, like I said last week, Enola's is better. Oh, it's much more even. Because I think it wasn't done in so much heat of the moment. It was a little bit more considered. And while I don't think it was gentle or kind in any way, it certainly was not the violence that Helen experienced. I have to wonder, if the Mariner were to dive down and find an old barber shop, if the clippers that he would be able to find in that shop would be at all usable i want to say no because the thing about electric clippers is that it's a lot of small parts moving very quickly i think he would do better to find a straight blade which even then it's one thing to find a blade underwater it's another thing to find a sharpening implement to get rid of the rust from the salt water i think best case scenario is some sort of scissors yeah although a nice sharp knife which his is that a machete or it's is it a... Essentially a crossover knife between full-on machete and cutting knife. I want to say it is a kukri style. Okay. Which I think is South Asian. I'm not entirely sure. It does look like the sort of knife that would be useful for bushwhacking. Exactly. Cutting through undergrowth, exactly. jungly area type stuff. That would have been a fine knife to use. If he had been more careful about it, he would have gotten so much more hair off of Helen. It goes back to what we were talking about last week, where she still has a lot of hair on her head. Yeah. Of some considerable length. Yes, she does. It's arguably the worst look for her. Oh, it is. I feel bad because Jean Triplehorn is so beautiful and her hair was so lovely. I really liked when she had it to like the side braid. It looked so nice. Okay, so side braid was definitely her best look. Yes. Followed closely by unbraided, just falling on her shoulders. And then this is by far worst. It kind of makes it easy to rank because there are only three hairstyles that she has. (laughs) And they start off good and go worse from there. But even so. (laughs) Even so. I do want to comment, just point out how lucky we are about the minute break. Between Uh last week and this week. Sometimes we get some really funky breaks. And this was in the middle. It cut right on a scene line of great effect. Like we got the glare from last week. And then this week, we've got the pair of them sitting there. Mm -hmm. And this episode break that we have, it kind of puts the violence of last week behind us a bit. And leaves us with this moment that... I think they want it to be comedic. Yeah. Where we have these two women with botched haircuts sitting there. It doesn't really help that they scurry away in fear of him, but the Mariner strides past them, gets to the mast, turns and says, did you say something? And they're like, no, there is some comedic elements to that. Yeah. The way that Enola goes, "Mm -mm." Uh uh-uh, yeah. I appreciate there's a bit of sass on the Mariner's side. Yeah. Like, he just got done teaching them a lesson, and he's relishing that they received the message. Yeah. That I can appreciate, especially having not so recently witnessed the violence 
that this is a result of. And Helen and Enola have been reprimanded to the point where they are a bit cowed right now. And not in a full-on answering to this sass from the Mariner, but when he gets to the top of the mast and he finds more drawings from Enola. Yeah, I was wondering about that. He's quite high up. He is very high up. And Enola she was is up there? Not, Enola is not a big child. She is a little girl. Like, for one, I don't doubt her bravery to go up there, but I doubt her physical ability to go up there. And Helen allowing her to go up there and the Mariner allowing her to go up there. Yeah. So she must have skirted both of the adults that they didn't see her, which I find hard to believe, and mustered the ability somewhere. I do get a bit of a kick out of the Mariner finding the drawings and then looking down at Helen and Enola and Enola hiding her face like a puppy who has been found in the pantry. Yeah. Digging through the dog snacks. She is mildly repentant, much like a dog who's been caught getting into the snacks. I think he's repentant right now, but give him a half an hour and he would gladly do the same thing. Enola's braids were taken from her. She has lost her Samson-like strength. (laughs) Smash cut to establishing shot of the Ds with the oars out and paddling. This view of the Ds. I'm grateful that they gave it to us because we get to see and glean so much from this. First of all, the amount of growth and crud on the rim that hits the water is just mind-boggling. It's like an entirely new platform. It is. And it also means, this just occurred to me now, because I was wondering about the height of the crud. Well, as they've been using the oil, the tanker has gotten lighter and lighter. It's sitting higher and higher in the water. Yep. So originally, those parts that have growth on them That was the water line, and it's been slowly rising because they've been consuming the oil. And then also huge gaping holes. I don't know how this thing is even seaworthy. Do you think those are wear and tear and time holes, or do you think those are attack holes? I think those are primarily wear and tear holes. But in the book, it mentions all of the ways that the smokers are using elements of their flagship to repurpose into other ways like taking great slabs of steel from the ship itself to melt down into ammunition so if these are rust holes in the side it makes sense that they could be made larger by smokers tearing away material that makes sense i really like that not sure that they have made the most intelligent choices about where to take material from yeah but they're not hugely intelligent people (laughs) (laughs) are we ready to move into the deacon's quarters yeah so before we get into the deacon's quarters of the movie i want to read a passage from the book describing this space it says the deacon's spacious quarters on the d's had once been a conference room the captain's quarters had not been spacious enough for a man of the deacon's magnitude Not that the deacon was physically imposing, but his personality and his appetites were huge. He had decorated the suite himself, with trophies from this conquest and that one. The Grand Crystal Chandelier had once upon a time lighted an opulent hotel ballroom in land days, or so the elder who presented it to him as a sort of duty offering, if only the smokers would spare the elder's atoll, which was called, if memory served, paradise. The deacon who had been offended by the very idea of one man of religion attempting to bribe another, had, of course, directed the Nord to slowly torture the Elder in order to pry loose the locations of any other of the Atoll's hidden treasures. Nothing else of much value turned up, however, and before long, the Elder and the rest of the Atoll and its inhabitants were sent off in search of another paradise, courtesy of smoker guns, blades, and fire. Other treasures, gathered from this plundered Atoll and that one, made the deacon's quarters a veritable palace. The orange shag rug, its vivid color spreading like a glowing memory of a day when the world wasn't shades of blue and gray. The purple plastic cocooned couches, another colorful reminder of a superior time and culture, and artworks, including his vivid painting on a velvet of the land day's religious icon, Elvis. And a more prosaic, if peaceful, portrait of some unidentified land day's personage, said to be the work of an artist named Rembrandt. (laughs) 
but he would gladly trade it for a John Wayne on Black Velvet. The size of the room lent itself to his putting range. Too bad, in a way, his orange shag was not green, and wearing sunglasses he bent over his putter, lining up a shot. The damn ball-bearing eyeball fell out and clicked against the sunglass lens. <laughs> There's some fantastic imagery there. I love the, the casualness of having a Rembrandt. Right next to a Velvet Elvis? Yes. The room here in the movie is a bit less opulent than the one described here in the book. For one thing, there's no chandelier. But what we do see are more piles of canned smeat as well as alcohol, specifically Black Death vodka boxes. Launched globally in 1987, by 1995, Black Death Vodka was selling more than 120 million bottles and cans in over 60 countries. It had won over 30 medals in international competitions and became the preferred vodka among the rock music elite. At some point in the mid to late 90s, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms in the United States tried to ban Black Death Vodka because of the packaging of the bottles. There was an argument about the packaging looked like it was peddling poison instead of alcohol. And a Time magazine article said that the bottle looked like poison, but it was just vodka. And so the ban was ultimately tossed out. What's also interesting about this shot as we rise over the boxes is all of the different things that the deacon has here in his quote unquote office. For one thing, he has a somewhat working television. Yeah, he's watching a golf match or in the wide shot he's very much watching something that's not a golf match yeah but as the deacon swings back with his golf club hits the ball and sends it flying yelling four we cut in to the ball hitting a bunch of cans next to the television and we get a close-up look of the screen which is showing a golf video so that explains why he is such a golfer mm-hmm yep I uh, remember back when I was living alone and I was quite poor, all I had for TV was a combo VCR TV. So I would go to Goodwill and get whatever VHSs were available that were of interest to me. I got some weird stuff. I saw some weird movies. It was all based on what was available at Goodwill at the time. And it was weird. So after some point, that's just the stuff you like now. Yep. Is what's available. <laughs> so if he has a golf video, well, that's a hobby of his now. Yep. Because once you find the golf video and you also have the golf clubs, well, hey, that's that's all you need. The golf ball that he has on hand is quite ragged. Yeah. It's still ball shaped, but there's not much golf about it. <laughs> <laughs> certainly no divots. No, certainly no divots. I was distracted by the stack of VHS tapes sitting next to this television. Of course you were. I expect nothing less of you. I have spent many hours on the clock at work <laughs> sifting through VHS tapes. I am no stranger to this format because I inherited a very large archive of cassette tapes where I work. And I have not been able to put them all over into DVD. It's a project that no one at the college besides me has expressed any interest in. I'm not sure why I haven't tossed all of them out, but I digress. There are six cassette tapes in this stack. The top two are in plastic cases, and the spines are turned in such a way that we can't see what's on them. The third in the stack is out of a case, and it seems to have a handwritten label on it. I'm assuming it's one of those blank cassette tapes that you can buy at a department store and then you pop it in your VCR, record what's on TV. If you're like Julia's mom, you're really good at pausing and unpausing commercial breaks so you don't yep. have to worry about that stuff. But I was unable to figure out what was on that label just because of the magnitude at which I was zooming in and how blurry the footage had become. So I'm not sure what that third one is. But the fourth tape, because the label is sticking out, is a copy of the 1992 Kurt Russell film, Unlawful Entry. Does that ring any bells? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm going for it. Unlawful Entry. So according to the Wikipedia entry, 
It is a 1992 American psychological thriller directed by Jonathan Kaplan and starring Kurt Russell, Madeline Stowe, and Ray Liotta. The film involves a couple who befriend a lonely policeman, only for him to develop an unrequited fixation on the wife, leading to chilling consequences. Ray Liotta was nominated for an MTV Movie Award for Best Villain in 1993 for this portrayal of the psychotic cop. The film was remade in Bollywood as Fareb in 1996. Okay, what else is in that stack? So, next up, the fifth tape appears to say Billabong on the side. It is written in a scripty language, and the letters shrink as the title goes on. I could not for the life of me find a film by that title released before 1995, and I was equally unsuccessful in finding that box for the VHS. So I'm not quite sure what's about that. But the sixth and final VHS in the stack is none other than Beethoven's second, the 1993 American family film directed by Rod Daniel and starring Charles Grodin, Bonnie Hunt, and Debbie Mazar, and is the second of eight installments in the Beethoven film series. I'm sorry, remind me again what year that last movie was from? Beethoven's second came out in 1993. Okay, so the two that we were able to ID are contemporary movies. Yes. Okay. I've never actually seen any of the Beethoven movies. I remember seeing them advertised in a lot of the VHSs that I would watch as a kid, because it is a family movie released in the early to mid 90s. So, of course, I would see a lot of those advertised to kids. Wait, is this the dog movies? Oh, yes. Oh, ew. These oh, they're the so movies. gross. Because he's so slobbery. And, like, his slobber is almost a character in the movies. Oh, I've never seen them. Caveat, I've never seen the movies. This is based off of the advertisements. I feel like there was a different large pet movie released around the same time. And I probably saw that one. But I can't for the life of me remember what it was. So that doesn't really add much to the discussion. Yeah. One thing that I can offer about the movie Beethoven's Second is that it cost $15 million to make. And at the box office, it made $118 million. Oh my gosh. So it was remarkably more successful than the movie Waterworld. Oh jeez. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> Going back into the scene proper, the Nord comments that it was a nice putt. The Deacon specifies that that was not a putt, it was a drive, and he wasn't even using his good eye. At which point he expresses frustration with that eye, lifts up his goggle eye patch, and pops out the false eye. And I have to appreciate that the Deacon is giving the false eye a good run. Yeah. He's, gi he's giving it a chance. He is. Which is remarkable because if he's got the eye patch on, then why does he need an eyeball? Those are solving the same problem in different ways. So you don't need both of them. But it's handy if you just need to acclimate to the new eyeball and you don't wear it all the time. Or like here, the eyeball doesn't actually like fit in your face. So I, I really don't see any point. I like the, eyeball. the part in the book where it says that the eyeball clinks against the inside of a pair of sunglasses that he's wearing <laughs> as if it is so loose that it just rolls out. Yeah. So the Nord comments, you said to bring the pilot. Deacon agrees. And Nord says, well, he's here. And the Deacon says, oh, well, why didn't you tell me? And it's like the pilot's been sitting there this entire the time. whole time. No one told the Deacon about the huge blind spot that he now had. Sure, they mentioned depth perception, and he made oh a comment about the short game. But yeah, now he's living with a massive blind spot. Oh my gosh. Okay, all right. I feel a little bit ashamed because I also have a massive blind spot. I only have about half of the vision in my right eye, which means I have no right peripheral vision, which is just a delight for driving. <laughs> So this really should have occurred to me, that when the deacon is turned toward the TV, his blind spot is on the side of where everybody is sitting. Mm -hmm. So he very specifically cannot see the couch and that wall and the doctor and the pilot sitting there. 
did not occur to me. That's how accustomed I have grown to my gigantic blind spot. (laughs) Before we get into the interaction from the movie, here's how the interaction goes in the book. You said to bring the pilot, the Nord said, when he returned. Deacon replies, he's back? Good. Urgency in his face, the Nord stepped forward. He spotted them. There was a skirmish. Bring him in, the deacon snapped off his sunglasses. Let him, let him tell me himself. And soon the pilot, holding his battered cap in both hands, looking exhausted and emotionally wrung out, slumped before his master. The deacon placed a paternal hand on the pilot's shoulder. Tell me what happened. They, they killed Ed. The pilot choked back tears. Tragic. So very tragic. The child. Did the fishman have the tattooed girl? The pilot nodded. Yeah, and some atoll bitch. She's the one that shot Ed. Harpooned him. There are many bad people in Waterworld, the deacon allowed with a somber shake of the head. Then he slipped a supportive arm around the chief pilot and gave him a manly hug. But we both know there's plenty more where Ed came from. Now which way were they heading? I love the reference to good people versus bad people because we were talking about that last week or the week before. In the interaction that we saw, the only person that killed anybody was Helen. Yeah. So in this isolated incident, yeah, she's the bad person. If you only look at this one thing, never mind that they were being shot at Mm -hmm. and she did it in self-defense. But if you ignore that, she's the only one that killed anybody. I think I like the way it is in the movie where the pilot has been here the whole time and he's not brought forward. Oh, yeah. This is fantastic. If you realize that it's because of the deacon's gigantic blind spot that he doesn't know the pilot's already there, the whole thing becomes a little bit funnier. Yeah. So in the movie, Deacon says, come on, Nord. Well, tell me about it. The child, did he have her with him? And the smoker says, yeah, and some atoll bitch, they killed Ed. And the Deacon says, now, now, don't fret yourself. Plenty more where Ed came from. And I really like the line, plenty more where Ed came from, because it subtly reveals exactly how the Deacon feels about the individual smokers on the Ds. That they are just dime a dozen. They are tools to be used up. And are very replaceable. I do get the feeling that this is a Jack Black performance. That Mm -hmm. there are some choices in his delivery that are his choices. I like that you've got Jack Black. He's sitting on the couch. He's got a bottle in one hand. And he is slamming his fist on the couch as he's tearfully remembering his friend Ed, who was killed by this atoll bitch. He is devastated. And It's, it's delightful because... It's real affection that he had for his comrade. I know I mentioned it in the episode that we recorded earlier, but I am a little bummed out that we don't have Chris and Candace for this scene to really show off Jack Black. Because if you haven't noticed beforehand, now you know it's him. So if we compare the partnership between Jack and Eddie and Nux and Slit from Fury Road, which have a lot of similarities in their setup a driver and a lancer and they're both bad guys that think they're the good guys Mm -hmm. yeah the dynamics are completely different could not be more opposite where there is a genuine sense of partnership between jack and eddie here in Waterworld, and nux and slit do nothing but fight yeah and even once they do seem to like settle their differences and get in the car and just do their thing Everything's fine for a while, but then once Nux is out of the picture, Slit is like back to just being all about himself and glorifying himself. And yeah, you get there's the an element of jealousy towards Nux for attention that he gets. Yeah, the Nux and Slit relationship is definitely more of a rivalry friendship yes. than an actual friendship. You got the sense that Jack and Ed genuinely enjoyed what they did. Right. That's a vibe I think I get. From Pilots? Where did I get that vibe from? Oh, it's from a series of books that I read recently. Over the summer, I read the Calculating Stars trilogy about astronauts in the mm, 50s, I think is when it starts. And a lot of the astronauts are pilots beforehand, and you get a lot of that pilot work. Mm -hmm. And you do get this sense of, I don't care what it's for, but I just want to fly. Like, just let me fly. Yeah. I just want to fly a plane. That is my passion. That's where I want to be. I will do whatever job you need to be done as long as it's in the air. The Nord has the smoker pilot point out on the map where 
they were starting from and what trajectory they were doing. I find it so interesting that they are using these nautical maps to track movements when there's no land to work off of. And it's just an example of me being a landlubber, not knowing how to navigate on the ocean right. without longitudes or latitudes or right. any sort of references. I am an ocean lover. I love being out on boats. I love being next to the ocean. In my brain, I orient myself to my relationship to the ocean. Like I always know which way is north and south and east and west because I know where the ocean is compared to where I am. But these people who only live on water have a completely different relationship with directions than we do. They've got ours the sun is, and the stars. Yeah, ours is always in relation to <laughs> land. Theirs is relation to, yeah, sun and stars. So it baffles me too. As a small side note, in this scene, behind Jack Black is hanging a calendar. And we see that it is a January calendar with the first being on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So that calendar is most likely, I mean, there are many, many years that start on a Saturday, but so did 1994. Yep. So it's probably a 1994 calendar. So I did some digging on Wikipedia. Did you see the list of, I think there were 10, maybe nine instances of the calendar starting on January 1st? Yeah. But it's probably not any of those years. It's probably 1994. It's most likely 1994 because where are you going to find a calendar for 1983 when you are doing production design in 1994? Yeah. <laughs> All of the movies in the pile were from the early 90s. Yeah, they were. They were. It, it is, <laughs> was clearly set dressed in the 90s. Yeah. I'm a little surprised you don't see smokers in fluorescent colored windbreakers. <laughs> Sure, they'd be covered in soot, but it's hard to cover up a fluorescent colored windbreaker. Oh, it is. <laughs> the Nord points at the map. He says, if we launch now, we can cut him down just about here, pointing to the map, if he doesn't change course. And the deacon says, that's not likely. He's a wily one, that the demon. And oh. the scene cuts off. <laughs> okay, those statements seem to be opposing to me. So... We'll intercept him here unless he changes course. And the deacon says, that's not likely. He's a wily one. But if he was wily, wouldn't he switch directions? Right. And if he didn't switch directions, wouldn't that mean he isn't wily? It's So I think it's a case of the character doesn't know what words mean. Even though he knows ichthy, he may not know wily. So there is an interesting bit of editing here with the Ulysses cut. Because right after the deacon says that ichthy demon... We cut to the Mariner on the Trimoran. We are going back to him for the next several episodes. When we eventually rejoin the Deacon and the Nord, they are picking up exactly where this scene left off. He has just said the Ichthy Demon, and he's going to keep going with this line of thought, saying that if the Mariner knows that he's been spotted, he'll expect us to expect him to change course. We're not going to hear that interaction until episode 44. Oh, that is so weird. Because spending a bunch of time on the trimoran tells us that time is passing. But between these two cuts on the Ds, no time passes. The chunk of time that we spend with the Deacon at the tail end of this scene that has been moved to later in the movie is maybe about 30 seconds. So I don't quite understand the editing choice to interject with the creepy drifter scene between now and when the scene concludes, mm -hmm. but they did it. That's how the editors chose to assemble this. Okay. The lesson that we should take from that is that the editors have just as much power in the telling of the story as the writer or the director. Uh-huh. But here at the end of this episode... The last thing we see, the last two seconds, is starting with Helen and Nola, and then we do a rack focus to a single cherry tomato that is just sitting on the vine, and the mariner's fingers come up, and he tests the firmness of the tomato. That's how we leave off. Yes, it is. We do get an establishing shot uh, where we sweep over the trimoran, and I'm no mariner, so I couldn't tell you that all of the lines and cables and whatnot are back in place. But the boat looks fine. Oh, and yeah. the harpoon is back in place. That mm -hmm. I can't tell. 
so I don't know how much time is supposed to have passed, but they seem to have recovered relatively quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I also like how we get a quick peek of the headband, head wrap thing that Helen has put around her hair. It's very quick because of the rack focus, but yeah, we do get that she's trying to fix the fashion situation that she's found herself in. Yes, it'll be interesting to get a better look at that. <laughs> Join us next time. The Mariner will eat a tomato, Helen and Enola will go hungry, and we will meet a new, somewhat unsettling face. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tuohy, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of DanielBatista.com. Our home on the internet is MadMaxMinute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at MadMaxMinute. And like us on Facebook by searching MadMaxMinute and join our Facebook listener group, MadMaxMinute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit Patreon.com slash MadMaxMinute. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld Episode 39. We'll see you next time.